All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kev. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 106, and today I will be discussing the most significant revelation that I have discovered in my research, an idea that dawned on me during my first expedition to Egypt back in 2017 that has taken me six years to fully develop and understand. And after my recent adventure through England and Ireland, all of the puzzle pieces finally came together. Only after studying and attempting to understand the structures like Stonehenge, Avebury, and Silbury Hill, was I able to fully explain how it applied to the function of the Egyptian pyramids. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my greatest pleasure to present to you the symbolism of the white horse and the power source of the Egyptian pyramids, part one. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell so that you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Like, comment, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. Check out the Land of Chem members-only section, link in the video description below, for exclusive research content and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. If you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, buckle your seatbelts, and here we go with tonight's episode. So during my first trip to Egypt in 2017, I vividly remember sitting at the hotel on the first night, looking up at the Giza Plateau and discussing with my friend that I thought these pyramids were designed to harness lightning, specifically the Great Pyramid. They are by far the tallest features on the landscape towering over absolutely everything else on the horizon. And I envisioned them being the ideal targets for lightning strikes, not only naturally occurring lightning, but lightning that was intentionally generated by the Giza Plateau Pyramid System. This was my first intuitive inspiration about the function of these structures, even before I went inside the Red Pyramid of Dashur and began to develop the idea that they were designed to produce chemicals on an industrial scale. And until then, I have kept it under wraps, because until my recent expedition to England and Ireland, I didn't fully understand the mechanisms of operation that would make this system work. But I do now. And fast forward six years, from 2017 to 2023, when I somehow earned the honor of working with one of the most prolific research organizations of our time, the ACIDA Project. And they gave me the exclusive opportunity to interpret and present the chemical analysis data that they collected during their expeditions to Egypt. And a few months ago, as I was reviewing the most recent batch of samples, I discovered this. A sample containing a silicate microsphere that was described by the ACIDA project lead geologist of being of fulgurite genesis. This sample was taken from around the quote unquote trial passages adjacent to the Great Pyramid on its eastern side. An area that I have presented recently on the members only channel showing abundant evidence of the strategic acidic leach mining that was occurring on the Giza Plateau, utilizing the sulfuric and hydrochloric acid solutions that were being produced in the Great and Central Pyramids, respectively. Here is the area where the sample was taken and a close-up of that material. Now, for those of you that are not familiar, fulgurite is otherwise known as fossilized lightning. And I will quote here some important details about fulgurite 
that will be relevant as we proceed. Fulgurites are commonly called, quote unquote, fossilized lightning, and they form when lightning discharges into the ground. When ordinary negative polarity cloud to ground lightning discharges into the ground, current may propagate into silica rich quartzose sand, producing these fulgurite formations that include microspherules of silica. Next, fulgurites are structurally similar to Lichtenberg figures, which are the branching patterns produced on surfaces of insulators during dielectric breakdown by high voltage discharges such as lightning. And remember this phrase, quote unquote, branching patterns, as it will be coming up later in a spectacular Sunday site visit to a site whose name literally means Lake of the Branches. So this silicate microsphere, ladies and gentlemen, is the first piece of evidence that corroborates my hypothesis that lightning was striking the Giza Plateau, specifically the Great Pyramid. And in today's episode, I'm going to explain exactly how Cheryl Hill, Silbury Hill, and the Great Pyramid were designed not only to harness lightning, but also to create the conditions under which lightning occurs. And we are going to start with some research that describes why the locations for these structures were chosen. And I bring you this article titled, Telluric and Earth Currents, Lightning Strike Locations and Natural Resource Exploration. And I will quote several parts of this paper here. Telluric currents are natural electric currents flowing in the Earth's crust and mantle. Lightning strikes balance telluric and ionospheric capacitance by bridging the lower atmosphere dielectric with static bursts. Most lightning comes from cumulonimbus clouds which generate lightning. For cloud to ground lightning, the composite conductivity or resistivity of the rock matrix appears to have more influence on where cloud to ground lightning strikes occur. Their conclusion is that there are earth currents, which they call terra levis, shallow earth currents, in the depth range of natural resource exploration, which have a controlling impact on cloud to ground lightning strike locations and attributes. They present in this document, lightning analysis examples that lead to this conclusion. In some ways, this work is an extension of Nikola Tesla's experiment at his Pikes Peak Laboratory in 1889. When he confirmed that the earth itself could be used as an electrical conductor and verified some of his suspicions regarding the conductivity of the ionosphere. Next, geophysicists have known for decades that there are electrical currents in the earth and that these electrical currents are modified by natural resources which can be resistive, i.e. fresh water aquifers, oil, gas, salt, etc., or conductive, i.e. brines, clays, minerals like copper, iron, lead, zinc, gold, silver, and rare earths. Okay, so does any of this sound familiar? Fresh water aquifers. Oh, you mean like those that are located underneath the Giza Plateau and those that run underneath almost every ancient site that I have discussed in England and Ireland? Okay. How about the minerals like copper, iron, lead, etc.? Oh, the minerals that just happen to be present across the Giza Plateau in the iron oxide deposits that I have been presenting here on the channel. Okay, what about oil and gas resources? Oh, you mean the ones that are being processed 
in the oil and natural gas processing plant located right across the street from the Red Pyramid. I hope now you can see the big picture, that the location for these structures, not only the Egyptian pyramids, but the stone circle and mound structures from across Europe were meticulously selected due to the interaction of the natural resources at the site that increased the telluric currents or electric fields near the surface, making these sites the ideal targets for producing lightning strikes. But that is only the first part of the equation. And I hope by now you are perched on the edge of your seat and just prepare to have your minds melted when I get to the symbolism of the white horse. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to help support the channel, just check out thelandofchem.com. I have the new six degree green lion logo, the fifth degree central pyramid hydrochloric acid logo, the new second edition print copy of the Land of Chem book, this beautiful new Egyptian blue edition, signed copies, extremely rare, only 89 copies in existence of the original first edition, Purple Orchid Paper Print of the Land of Chem book are also available all at thelandofchem.com. So if you want to show some love, just check out the website. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for the support. All right, continuing with this research paper, allow me to quote here. Their conclusion is electrical currents in the rock matrix have much more impact on lightning strike locations than infrastructure. This conclusion is supported by the fact that there are 25% more lightning strikes at high lunar tide when compared to the number of lightning strikes at low lunar tide. As the moon goes around the earth, its gravity not only raises the oceans, it also raises the ground. This earth tide is much smaller than the ocean tides. However, it appears to have a significant impact on earth currents. The sun causes about a third as much of an earth tide as the moon does. So the earth tides need to be calculated using both the position of the moon and of the sun. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why structures like Stonehenge which you can see here, were also designed as astronomical observatories to track the movement of the sun and moon in order to calculate exactly when these lightning strikes would occur. And I am just getting warmed up here. Yalabina, let's go. Doc, it's my only hope. Marty, I'm sorry. But the only power source capable of generating 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. What did you say? A bolt of lightning. Unfortunately, you never know when or where it's ever going to strike. We do now. This is it. This is the answer. So in conclusion, before we proceed, Allow this to be the foundation of evidence for everything that you are about to see. And I quote, we have come to the conclusion that there are earth currents, which have a controlling impact on cloud to ground lightning strike locations. In some ways, this work is an extension of Nikola Tesla's experiment at his Pikes Peak laboratory in 1889, when he confirmed that the earth itself could be used as an electrical conductor. Now, on to the White Horse and Cheryl Hill. And the first time I laid eyes upon this hillside and obelisk at its apex, I knew exactly what was going on here. And it is finally time for me to show you how this functional landscape feature once operated. First, you survey the landscape to determine the ideal hillside to construct your cumulonimbus cloud generator, an area that experiences abundant natural lightning strikes, sitting atop these telluric current field lines or ley lines, and is composed of the perfect material, 
which in this case happens to be chalk. Chalk is both a dielectric material and a substance that can produce highly exothermic chemical reactions. And this is precisely what we have here at Cheryl Hill and the seven chalk hills of Wiltshire, England. So here you can see these telluric currents of the earth rising up to the surface causing polarization of your dielectric material chalk in the direction of the electric current with the negative charges moving toward the bottom and the positive charges moving toward the top. And down here, we have the natural spring water flowing under the hillside, which is still being pumped and cleaned today in these two here and here, modern pump stations at the bottom of the hill. So as these positive charges move in the direction of the apex of the hill, they provide the ideal target for negatively charged cloud to ground lightning, just as described in the research article. So the ancient civilization that conceived of this spectacular system, constructed a stone pillar or obelisk at the top of the hill designed to focus that electric discharge into the hillside. And I have said since day one that the Egyptian pyramids were not producing electricity. And as you know, I choose my words very carefully and I use that phrase intentionally. Because according to the technical definition, lightning is not electricity. It is an instantaneous electrostatic discharge in the dielectric medium of air. So during a naturally occurring cumulonimbus cloud lightning storm, the negative charges in the cloud will discharge to balance the telluric and ionospheric capacitance toward the positive charges at the top of the hillside, striking the obelisk or stone pillar. And remember that stone is not a conductor, but rather a dielectric material. And when the capacitance of this material is exceeded, as it would when being struck by lightning, a phenomenon known as dielectric breakdown occurs, which transforms that material from an insulator into a conductor, allowing the electric current to pass through into the hillside. This current produces an immense amount of heat energy that causes a chemical reaction, transforming the chalk calcium carbonate into calcium oxide, releasing carbon dioxide. Next, the earthwork enclosure here at the top of the hill is flooded with water as described in the previous episodes. And the water will flood through this earthwork channel system, moving downhill from here in this direction and downhill from here in this direction. Flowing down the hillside, producing an extremely exothermic chemical reaction. And here is a picture of the modern water pump station that is located at the bottom of the hillside that is still pumping and cleaning this subterranean water supply today. And like I said before, there are two of these pump stations at the bottom of the hill here and here. So the water flooding your earthwork enclosure system reacts with the calcium oxide, as you can see here, to produce calcium hydroxide. This is an extremely exothermic reaction that produces tremendous amounts of heat. Well, 
It just so happens that the heat rising from the surface of the earth is the first step in generating a cumulonimbus lightning cloud. So the wind sweeping up off this hillside carries that heat energy into the atmosphere, generating more cumulonimbus clouds. A process that is depicted here, describing lightning cloud formation. And you can see the heat energy depicted here in red, sweeping up off of this hillside into the atmosphere, which begins to produce more cumulonimbus clouds that will generate more lightning. And you can see here that it is a two part system with hot air circulating into the atmosphere here and a cold air front moving in here. And I'll show you a perfect example of how these chalk hills do exactly that in just a moment. So what we have here is the first step of an immense circuit that utilizes naturally occurring lightning strikes to produce more cumulonimbus clouds and thus more lightning. Ladies and gentlemen, the chalk hills of Wiltshire are lightning storm generators. And you can see here in this aerial image of Cheryl Hill, the obelisk, at the apex, the earthwork enclosure that will carry water downhill in this direction and downhill in this direction. Moving toward these depressions in the hillside that were most likely partially formed as water flowed down the hill. And the white horse symbol inscribed upon the face of the structure. So now, what is the meaning of this esoteric white horse symbol? And this is where things get really interesting. So I will quote here regarding the meaning of the white horse across many different religions and mythological texts. In more than one tradition, the white horse bursts into existence in a fantastic way, emerging from the sea or a lightning bolt. In Zoroastrianism, one of the three representations of Tishtira, the hypostasis of the star Sirius, is that of a white stallion. White horses are also said to draw divine chariots, who is the Avestus divinity of the waters, representing various forms of water. Her four horses are named wind, rain, clouds, and sleet. Islamic culture tells of a white creature named Al-Burak. Al-Burak means lightning in Arabic. Islamic traditions envision that the Mahdi will appear riding a white horse. A huge white horse appears in Korean mythology in the story of the kingdom of Silla. The horse emerged from a bolt of lightning, bowing to a shining egg. Now, let me reiterate what I have just explained in the previous slides. The chalk hills of Wiltshire are functional landscape features that harness natural lightning to create a feedback loop involving exothermic chemical reactions to produce more cumulonimbus clouds and lightning. These chalk hills, emblazoned with the alchemical symbol of the white horse, are cumulonimbus cloud and lightning generators. And you can see here on the right, another of these hilltop systems inscribed with the white horse. The water would flow downhill in this direction and downhill in this direction. 
the wind carrying the heated air swept off of this scalloped hillside back here. And this other side, unaffected by the exothermic chemical reaction of water and calcium oxide, produced the cold air circulation in the front. Secrets in plain sight, ladies and gentlemen, the white horse is a symbol of these cumulonimbus clouds. And it is inscribed on seven of these functional hillsides across Wiltshire, England, indicating their part of an immense system of structures that utilized harnessed lightning. So for any of you that live in England or anywhere near the UK, go get on a plane or take a day hike to Wiltshire and let the secrets of the ancient past be revealed through the white horse. It is plain as day and secrets are right there to show you exactly how these hillsides operated. It will not only change your life, but also your perspective on your English heritage forever. Now, seeing these seemingly innocuous chalk hills through the eyes of this miraculous and brilliant civilization, you will realize that the symbol of the white horse, ladies and gentlemen, is a cumulonimbus cloud that produces lightning. All right, now, are your minds and faces completely melted yet? This is just the beginning. So now, let's move on to Silbury Hill, which you can see here. With its external reservoir completely flooded during a recent heavy rainstorm. And as I have mentioned in the previous episodes, there is a significant similarity between the flattened top of this chalk pyramid and the flattened top of the Great Pyramid in Giza. And I will show you why the Great Pyramid was never designed to have a capstone. It is meant to be completely flat. So now let's go back to electromagnetic field experiment number two that I conducted during my 2022 research expedition where I had Yusuf carve a limestone pyramid so that we could test the geometry of the pyramid in relation to the electric discharges that we saw in the first experiment. And I will insert a clip now so you can see exactly what happened to the electric discharge as we moved from the base of the pyramid to the apex, and I will explain exactly why this phenomenon occurs. All right, now, let me roll the footage from Electromagnetic Field Experiment Part 2. And you can see here that as the copper wire moves up the side of the pyramid from the base, this electric discharge completely disappears as it reaches the apex of the pyramid. And you can still see the discharge into the copper wire. And as it reaches the top, the discharge completely disappears. And the reason that this occurs is because of surface area of the dielectric material. At the base and along the sides of the limestone, there is plenty of surface area for the polarized charges to accumulate. However, as you move to the top, the surface area decreases and eventually reaches zero. This is the impetus for the pyramid design of these structures. So at the apex, there is no surface area for charge to accumulate and thus no discharge will occur. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why the great Pyramid of Giza never had a capstone. It was designed with a flat top to allow 
the accumulation of polarized charges within the dielectric material. And this polarization of dielectric material is depicted here. With the telluric currents of the earth rising up toward the surface, causing polarization of the dielectric limestone material in the direction of the current flow with the negative charges moving toward the bottom and the positive charges moving toward the top. And it just so happens this phenomenon of the Great Pyramid concentrating electromagnetic energy was recently described in yet another research paper that you can see here. Quote, study reveals the Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy. And I'll be doing a follow-up episode discussing the results of this prolific research paper coming up very soon. So here on the Giza Plateau, we have the exact same methodology for attracting lightning strikes on to the Great Pyramid with the other two pyramids being unaffected as no charges will accumulate at their apexes due to the lack of surface area. And we have already seen proof of these lightning strikes around the Great Pyramid in the fulgurite silicate microspheral that I showed at the beginning of the episode. So the Great Pyramid is a dielectric, lightning-powered, acoustic, sonochemical, catalyst chemical reactor that produced sulfuric acid for the strategic leach mining of metallic ore deposits on the Giza Plateau. And let me repeat that one more time before we proceed. The Great Pyramid is a dielectric, lightning-powered, acoustic, sonochemical catalyst chemical reactor that produced sulfuric acid for the strategic leach mining of metallic ore deposits on the Giza Plateau. And again, as I have said since day one, the Great Pyramid was not producing electricity. It was harnessing the electrostatic discharge phenomenon of lightning to produce chemicals. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what you can anticipate as we move forward here on the Land of Chem and in the second book of the Land of Chem series. It gets so much deeper than you could ever imagine. So now, back to Silvery Hill. And this same ancient knowledge of dielectrics and exothermic chemical reactions applies to the operation of Silvery Hill. As this civilization began building structures to achieve the same results that were accomplished within the chalk hillsides. A pyramid structure made of chalk was constructed, allowing the polarization of the dielectric material caused by the Earth's telluric electric currents, as depicted here. The accumulation of positive charges on the flat surface apex of the mound provided the ideal place for negative cloud to ground lightning to strike. Creating a chemical reaction within the chalk producing calcium oxide and releasing carbon dioxide. The calcium oxide was thus prepared and could be activated whenever needed to create additional cumulonimbus clouds and lightning strikes simply by flooding the reservoir, which transforms the calcium oxide into calcium hydroxide, releasing an abundant amount of heat energy into the atmosphere thus generating more clouds and lightning bolts, 
And this explains why Silbury Hill was expanded over many generations as the calcium oxide was gradually consumed in the transformation to calcium hydroxide. Thus, more chalk was added to the mound and the process continued. And you can see here the landscape surrounding Silbury Hill with some landscape features whose names describe exactly what was occurring during this ancient time. With your exothermic chemical reaction generator here, Silbury Hill, and over on this side, a hill called Windmill Hill. Once again, secrets in plain sight, right in your face, as this hillside is a literal wind mill to produce wind. With the wind sweeping off of this face here, carrying the heat energy from Silbury Hill up into the atmosphere, and the cool air sweeping off of this side, pushing the air into the atmosphere, creating the circulation that produces the coveted white horse, the lightning cloud that powered all of these systems. And coming up in this month's members only episode, I will be presenting a full expose explaining the function of the Avebury stone circle, which you can see here, the Adam and Eve stones located in Longstone Cove over here, and the function of the sanctuary. And some never before seen footage that will not be presented here on the public channel. So if you want access to this exclusive content and the unreleased footage, like my second expedition to the Lost Pyramid, which is already up in the members section in episode two, please subscribe using the link in the video description below. And now, I will let you digest everything that you just heard, as I know it is an overwhelming idea to try and understand, as I have so much more to cover regarding the function of the entire Giza Plateau chemical manufacturing sequence that will take us back through every single pyramid and structure that I have covered thus far here on the channel. The Step Pyramid, the Red and Bent Pyramids of Dashur, Abu Sir and the Solar Temple of Abu Ghraib, the implications of this knowledge apply to all of them. The proto-pyramids and stone circle structures of Europe embody the same knowledge and sciences that were taken to their pinnacle within the Egyptian pyramids. And they evolved from simple mound structures whose functional materials were utilized to produce exothermic chemical reactions into perfect pyramids that feature complex internal reaction chambers for the same purpose. And as I have said since day one, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So for now, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I drop the mic and the crowd goes wild. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 106, Lightning the power source of the Egyptian pyramids, part one. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in this week's upcoming Sunday site visit, the exceptional footage from my expedition to the West Kennet Long Barrow. This is an episode you do not want to miss. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Lamb Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell, like, comment, stay tuned. If you want to help support this channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section Link in the video description below for exclusive research and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. If you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's episode. So I will see you next time. Yo. Are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. 
new videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.